It is not about winning. It's not about losing. It's about showing up and being seen. When I was a young researcher, doctoral student, my first year I had a research professor who said to us, here's the thing, if you cannot measure it, it does not exist. So I was very excited about this, and so I thought, you know what, this is the career for me, because I am interested in some messy topics, but I want to be able to make them not messy. I want to understand them, I want to hack into these things that I know are important, and lay the code out for everyone to see. So where I started was with connection, because connection is why we're here. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. So very quickly, really about six weeks into this research, I ran into this unnamed thing that absolutely unraveled connection in a way that I didn't understand or had never seen. And so I pulled back out of the research and thought, I need to figure out what this is. And it turned out to be shame. And shame is really easily understood as the fear of disconnection. Is there something about me that if other people know it or see it, that I won't be worthy of connection. The things I can tell you about it, it's universal. We all have it. The only people who don't experience shame have no capacity for human empathy or connection. No one wants to talk about it, and the less you talk about it, the more you have it. What underpinned this shame, this I'm not good enough, which we all know that feeling, I'm not blank enough, I'm not thin enough, rich enough, beautiful enough, smart enough, promoted enough. The thing that underpinned this was excruciating vulnerability, this idea of in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be seen, really seen. My one year has turned into six years, thousands of stories, hundreds of long interviews, focus groups. At one point, people were sending me journal pages and sending me their stories, um, thousands of pieces of data in six years. And I kind of got a handle on it. I kind of understood this is what shame is, this is how it works. I wrote a book, I published a theory, but something was not okay. And what it was is that if I roughly took the people I interviewed and divided them into people who really have a sense of worthiness, that's what this comes down to, a sense of worthiness. They have a strong sense of love and belonging. And folks who struggle for it, and folks who are always wondering if they're good enough. There was only one variable that separated the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging and the people who really struggle for it and that was the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging believe they're worthy of love and belonging. And so here's what I found. What they had in common was a sense of courage. And the original definition was to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. They had the compassion to be kind to themselves first and then to others because as it turns out, we can't practice compassion with other people if we can't treat ourselves kindly. They were willing to let go of who they thought they should be in order to be who they were which is you have to absolutely do that for connection. The other thing that they had in common, they fully embraced vulnerability. They believed that what made them vulnerable made them beautiful. This is the world we live in. We live in a vulnerable world. The problem is, and I learned this from the research, that you cannot selectively numb emotion. You can't say, here's the bad stuff. Here's vulnerability, here's grief, here's shame, here's fear, here's disappointment. I don't want to feel these. The marching orders for my therapist and my husband were do not read the comments online. And so one morning I woke up and there were two or three new articles out and I started reading the comments. And they were devastating. Um, they weren't about my work, they were about me. They were super personal. And they were the things that creative people play in their mind and then give up doing what they really want to do. Up until that moment had inspired me to stay very small in my life and my career, just so I could avoid those things. This is who I want to be. I want to create. I want to make things that didn't exist before I touched them. I want to show up and be seen in my work and in my life. And if you're going to show up and be seen, there is only one guarantee, and that is you will get your kicked. That is the guarantee. That's the only certainty you have. If you're gonna go in the arena and spend any time in there whatsoever, especially if you've committed to creating in your life, you will get your kicked. So you have to decide at that moment, I think for all of us, if courage is a value that we hold, this is a consequence. You can't avoid it.
I think what I've learned in doing the research on belonging is that belonging is being a part of something bigger than yourself, but it's also the courage to stand alone and to belong to yourself above all else. But here's a thing that has changed everything for me. I belong to me. So even when I feel alone and I wonder like, who's my crew and who are my people? I belong to me for sure, for the first time in my life. I was so shocked to learn in the research that the opposite of belonging is fitting in. Because fitting in is assessing a group of people and thinking, who do I need to be? What do I need to say? What do I need to wear? How do I need to act? And changing who you are. And true belonging never asks us to change who we are. It demands that we be who we are. If we fit in because how we've changed ourselves, that's not belonging. Because you betrayed yourself for other people. Mm. And that's not sustainable. You have to show up as who you are. You can lose yourself in the fitting in and you can lose yourself in the rebuttal to the fitting in. Everywhere I go, no matter where it is or who I'm with, as long as I never betray myself. And the minute I become who you want me to be in order to fit in and make sure people like me is the moment I no longer belong anywhere. So I started looking in the research and I found a definition from Charles Feltman that I think is the most beautiful definition I've ever heard. And it's simply this, trust is choosing to make something important to you, vulnerable to the actions of someone else. And I think I do know what trust is. And I put together an acronym, BRAVING, B-R-A-V-I-N-G, BRAVING. Because when we trust, we are braving connection with someone. So what are the parts of trust? B, boundaries. I trust you if you are clear about your boundaries and you hold them and you're clear about my boundaries and you respect them. There is no trust without boundaries. R, reliability. I can only trust you if you do what you say you're going to do and not once. Reliability, let me tell you what reliability is in research terms. We're always looking for things that are valid and reliable. A reliable scale is a scale that if I got on it a hundred times, it's gonna say the same thing every time. So what reliability is, is you do what you say you're going to do over and over and over again. You cannot gain and earn my trust if you're reliable once, because that's not the definition of reliability. In our working lives, reliability means that we have to be very clear on our limitations so we don't take on so much that we come up short and don't deliver on our commitments. In our personal life, it means the same thing. A, huge, accountability. I can only trust you if, when you make a mistake, you are willing to own it, apologize for it, and make amends. No accountability, no trust. V, and this one shook me to the core. Vault, what I share with you, you will hold in confidence. What you share with me, I will hold in confidence. We don't understand the other side of the vault. That's only one door on the vault. Here's where we lose trust with people. I, integrity. I cannot trust you and be in a trusting relationship with you if you do not act from a place of integrity and encourage me to do the same. Here's what I think integrity is. Three pieces. It's choosing courage over comfort, choosing what's right over what's fun, fast, or easy, and practicing your values, not just professing your values. In non-judgment, I can fall apart, ask for help, and be in struggle without being judged by you, and you can fall apart and be in struggle and ask for help without being judged by me, which is really hard because we're better at helping than we are asking for help. The last one is G, generosity. Our relationship is only a trusting relationship if you can assume the most generous thing about my words, intentions, and behaviors, and then check in with me. It's not joy that makes us grateful, it's gratitude that makes us joyful.